Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. My name is Ilgin Yorulmaz. I am the second vice president at the club and part of diversity committee. Um, just a couple of housekeeping rules, please. Um, keep your mobile phones off or silent, and always keep your mask on, um, especially when you're asking questions or commenting at the, co at the microphone. Before we begin, um, I would like to offer our sympathies for all of those um, in war-torn Ukraine and other countries who have died, been displaced, or had to flee as a result of terrible events that have happened and are happening right now in their home countries. The Ukraine crisis highlights the misery of the so-called other refugees who have had to leave in similar circumstances to arrive in Japan in the past. Today, we'll discuss what Japan is doing or failing to do to accept people from one of these conflict zones, Afghanistan. After the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan in August 2021, many professionals, students, academics, and others had to escape when they were targeted for their ethnic origin or religion, like in the case of Shia Hazars, gender, especially women and girls, or simply for working in media, civil society, or foreign organizations promoting human rights in the country. Since October last year, around 600 of what Japan calls hinanmin, or evacuees, have arrived in Japan from Afghanistan under short-term or emer emergency visas. So far, you might think very similar to the more recent case of Ukrainian evacuees. But that's where the similarities end. The Japanese government was incredibly quick to offer financial and material help, even promising counseling and language lessons to help settle the Ukrainian refugees. The kind of treatment that surprised even Japan watchers who have long known Japan's indifference at best and hostility at worst against refugees. Let's not forget that in 2020, Japan has granted refugee status only to 47 people out of 3,936 applicants, according to the Justice Ministry. And another 44 were granted residential status out of humanitarian considerations. So that's a total of 91 successful applications out of thousands. Our speakers today, Actions for Afghanistan, AFA, argue that while Japan's benign treatment of Ukrainians is much appreciated and actually what its overall refugee policy ought to be, it's the exception, not the rule. Their evidence, a recently published survey that they conducted among some of these 600 Afghan evacu evacuees in Japan. Those who spoke to AFA said that after more than six months, they are still waiting for their status to be recognized. And in the absence of a clear policy and support from Japan, and without employment, education, insurance, financial aid, or even Japanese language skills, they fear for their future. This is on top of the constant anxiety for safety of family members that they left in Afghanistan. Representing actions for Afghanistan is Keiko, Reiko, sorry, Reiko Ogawa and Nori, uh, Norimasa Ori here with us today to share the survey results. Reiko Ogawa is a sociology professor at Chiba University and a board member of Japan Association for Migration Policy. She's also in a unique position serving as a refugee examination counselor at Japan's Ministry of Justice and also the co-editor of Gender, Care and Migration in East Asia. Norimasa Ori is the chair of the board of Pathways Japan, an organization established in July 2021 with the aim of opening new pathways for refugee students through education. He previously served as the program manager at the Japan Association for Refugees, where he supported the admission of 31 Syrian refugees to Japan in five years on education pathways. 
As usual, we are going to listen to the speakers uh, explain the survey results and their recommendations, and then we'll open it for question and answer and comments. Thank you. Ogawa Sensei. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'm Reiko Ogawa from Chiba University. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my profound sadness and anger to what is happening in Ukraine since the 24th of February, and hope that the evacuees from Ukraine to Japan would have sufficient support to start up their new lives in Japan. So far, we have seen such impressive initiatives by the state and society to support the smooth evacuation and resettlement of the people from Ukraine. Today, we want to call your attention on the issue of evacuees and would-be evacuees from Afghanistan, who are also facing a similar urgent situation of fleeing from violence and persecution. So AFA, AFA, was established last year as a civil society initiative to build a platform to support the smooth evacuation and resettlement of Afghans. It is consisted of four NGOs, namely Pathways Japan, represented today by Ori-san, and Shanti Volunteer Association, or SVA, Association for Aid and Relief Japan, that is called Nami o Taskeru Kai, and Peace Winds Japan, which have been providing humanitarian assistance in Afghanistan. I have been involved in AFA since its inception. I'm a sociologist working on labor migration, but happen to have former students from Afghanistan who seeked help. Also, Chiba Prefecture is a host to the local Afghan community, which is consisted largely by the ethnic minorities, where they also asked urgent help to bring their families in the fall of Kabul. So uh, who are the evacuees? Um, we need to understand uh, what kind of backgrounds they have. So first of all, they are the employees of the Japanese embassy and JICA. So these people were under a kind of a government sponsorship. And secondly, they were the employees of Japanese NGOs, which some of them had successfully been entered into the list of those evacuees under the self-defense force, which sort of uh, provided like a pathway. And they have been partly supported by the government, but of course, not all of them. And thirdly, which I am going to focus today, is the former and current mixed, the, the, the Monbusho, the Minister of Education, and JICA students. These are the students who have been sponsored by the Japanese government in the past years, and they are really facing a critical situation. And fourthly, families of Afghans who reside in Japan are also asking for help. Uh, there are about 3,400 3, uh, Afghans living in uh, Japan, and approximately half of them are concentrated in Chiba. So uh, I would like to explain about the international students who are uh, who studied in Japan. Well, basically, this was part of the commitment of the Japanese government to uh, develop human resources who would be able to uh, uh, sustain Afghanistan as part of the government officials. So actually in 2001, the project team was established within the, uh, the Ministry of Education by the then Prime Minister uh, Fumio Kishida, who is now the Prime Minister, to provide the educational cooperation for the recovery of Afghanistan. So since 2003, the next scholarship, the Monbusho Scholarship started, and from 2011, JICA uh, started the project entitled Project for the Promotion and Enhancement of the Afghan Capacity for Effective Development, which is called PEACE in short. So uh, altogether, there were like 1,400 students studying in Japanese universities in both the graduate school, the master's degree, and the PhD degree in the field of agriculture, science and technology, engineering, medicine, and law. So these students got the degree in the, Jap Jap in the Japanese universities, and then they returned to work in different ministries in Afghanistan including Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education, Rural Development, Agriculture, and the Abolished Women Affairs. And also some of them were teaching in the Kabul University as a faculty member.
So when the crisis happened in uh, August 15, uh, well, even before that, a large number of former international students seeked help to the uh, former supervisors, the faculty members, and the universities. So a large number of universities received these kind of call, including the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies, Hiroshima University, Nagoya University, and Kyushu University. So uh, all of them, uh, we, we struggle to help those former international students. And how did we do that? Um, there was uh, a, an, an idea coming from the Tokyo University of Foreign Studies to invite them as part-time lecturers to the university. So we started applying for the professor visa to the immigration agency to get the certificate of eligibility. That's called COE. So what are the situation of the international students? Well, uh, as you... Uh, you know already, they were, the, they were blamed because they studied in a foreign country, including Japan, and that became a huge risk. And of course, a large number of them were former government officials. And women, although they are highly educated, that reason uh, they precisely became targeted. And uh, the ethnic minorities were really in fear of persecution. And some received death notice, their homes were raided and uh, destroyed, and the family members were taken hostage, and some ev were even being killed. The door-to-door -door search had really terrified them, and they had to go hiding. And um, they, they also lost their job after the aug August uh, crisis, and um, the, the income decreased, or some of them don't have any income. My student told me that he used to have like 800 US dollar per month, but now he only receives 200. And even though he go to the office, there is no job. And what he said is that, now I realize that once you lose freedom, you know how important it is. But then when we started to work on this visa issue, there was just so many obstacles to do that. So at the moment, even though there were uh, quite a number of requests to be evacuated, the number that who actually could land up in Japan remains very, very limited. And this is because uh, the, the way that the university responded also differs. Do, to their limited resources. And unlike the Ukraine, uh, there is no public support for evacuation. So for the universities, for the part-time lecturers, it means that the monthly payment is really like 50,000 yen, which of course is not at all enough to sustain a family. So, and then the guarantor, in some cases it's the university, or some cases it's the former supervisor, they really need to spend their uh, money out of their own pocket, or if they can have some research funding, they would be able to support the former students. But otherwise, it becomes very, very difficult to financially back up the evacuees. And also, the other issue is the family visa in Japan is limited to spouse and children. But then, the, the evacuees wanted to invite their uh, sisters, the brothers, their parents. Of course, they have an extended family. And uh, the, the UNHCR issued a statement saying that uh, the family reunion is really helpful in supporting the, the smooth resettlement of the refugees. The other thing is also about the visa. For issuing the so short-term visa, they need to have a long-term plan for resettlement before the evacuation. So this means that they need to get a student visa or a working visa in order to get issued for the short-term visa, which is a bit complicated, and maybe we can address this later. And uh, in December, the UN High Commissioner on uh, Afghan Human Rights Council issued a statement that more than 100 ex-government officers in Afghanistan has been secretly executed. So the responses of the Japanese universities has been quite remarkable. Um, 
because uh, we're foreseeing this situation that uh, we have organized a symposium, which we had like more than 10 universities participating uh, to call for the government support. The Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology started an online petition where they gathered like 42,360 uh, sign signatures, which was submitted to the government. And the, the network of universities also came together and um, we issued a statement saying that um, we want the visa to be issued urgently, we want the family reunion to be achieved and also the support towards safe evacuation and some uh, financial support to the international students as well as the university and also calling for the uh, private public uh, initiative for the smooth resettlement of the former Afghan students, which was submitted to the different government offices. But till today, there is no response. So as part of AFA, uh, we did a survey uh, this year from January to February uh, towards the asking about uh, asking the Afghan evacuees about their situation and their prospects of being uh, of living in Japan. So this was done online, and the language was in English and Dari. And the number of responses was that we had 55 from Afghan evacuees, but uh, adding with the uh, family members. Uh, this becomes like 23% uh, of those who are living in Japan at that time, because by, by the end of January, there were only like 521 people, uh, Afghan evacuees in Japan. So this is the background of the respondents, which tells you that uh, only like 30% of them are government sponsored and the remaining, the 70% are sponsored by the private uh, sector, including the university. And 54% were uh, civil servant, 18% were university lecturer, and 7.3% were from JICA. And then uh, what was uh, Frightening was that 95% of the respondents indicated they were at risk of persecution if they returned to Afghanistan. So this includes uh, the, the reason why they thought so was that because they worked for the previous government, because they are connected to the non-Muslim country, including Japan, uh, uh, because they are a woman who, are, uh, who have high education, and uh, because they belong to a minority. So this is the voices of the evacuees, which I really want to convey to you today. Uh, having a PhD from Japan is the greatest reason to be persecuted. As a girl who is studying abroad, this will be a problem for me because Taliban are opposite of studying uh, or against studying of women. Taliban calls those who have worked with foreign organizations the infidels and justify killing them. Working for Japanese ODA projects is a reason for uh, persecution. There is no place for the ones who left the country. Besides, the Taliban knows that we are on scholarship and they have already announced that they don't need us anymore. And since we have left the country, we will not be forgiven by them, especially women and minorities. So this connection with Japan and Japanese institutions became one of the reasons of the threat. The major concern for them is that 87% of respondents wish to evacuate their families and relatives. But this has been extremely hard, as I explained. Many were particularly concerned about the safety of the spouse and parents, as there exists a high risk of persecution of remaining family members if their husbands are known that they are in Japan. So in some cases, the children cannot go to school because they fear that uh, once they question where the, fa where the father is, they would get into trouble. And they also uh, stated that they want their younger sisters con to continue their education in Japan, because that opportunity has been completely cut off. 
So these are the voices of the evacuees. My family has stayed in Afghanistan, and I am very worried about them. If they find them and find out that they are my family, they will really har harass them. Even the issue of taking them hostage is possible. My wife and my child are alone, and they need me. However, I cannot help them right now. I get depression and cannot sleep the whole night. I'm really suffering, and my family as well, but there is no one to hear us. So we need to question whose voices has been heard and whose voices has not been heard. My brother is arrested by Taliban, and we don't know where he is. I just want to bring my mother. She's sick. My wife is pregnant and my parents are suffering from different diseases. So these are all the, the concerns that the evacuees have. And finally, they say that in Japan, our life is full of concern and stress because there is no future plan for Afghan refugees from the government side. My university told me we only support you until March 20, 2022. After that, we can't support you. And as I mentioned, the university's resources are very limited. And even though they would be able to accept them and issue the visa as a professor visa, the employment is is really a problem, and they need to look for elsewhere. But then the problem is that for both the MEX scholars and the JICA scholars, they did not have much opportunity to study Japanese, because largely they are in the science field, and they, did, they wrote their uh, theses in English. So that becomes a big hindering factor. And I have many problems since I came to Japan. There is no support from the Japanese government or JICA. Nobody hear our voice. So 70% of them reported psychological concerns, including insomnia, depression, inability to concentrate, and lack of future prospects. So I would like to conclude that uh, what, where, where we stand today, uh, we still have a very urgent case that uh, of this issuing of the visa, because um, uh, the, the the people, uh, the, the visa is going to expire. Uh, the, this person is now in Iran, and they have a family. The visa is going to expire very soon. But uh, the state, the Japanese government, is not responding to this in an adequate manner. He is a uh, former mixed scholar uh, supported by the Monbu Kagakusho, but still the issuing of the short-term visa to be uh, changed to the designated activity visa, just like the Ukrainians, would become a problem. So then we need to question why certain passport holders are privileged over others, and how can it be justified when Japan had already ratified the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination? Thank you. Thank you, Ogawa-sensei. Yes, Ori-san, please, if you may, <coughs> shortly, please. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, my name is Ori uh, from uh, Ask Questions for Africans, and uh, since our time is a bit uh, limited, so I'm just briefly uh, cover some recommendations uh, from Accents for Afghans. And let me start this slideshow here. Whoops. Yep. This one. Yes. So uh, probably it doesn't work, so that's fine. Okay, so um, Okawa sensei basically covered the uh, issues, and uh, those people who could enter Japan with some visa are still facing some issues, and uh, uh, probably the recommendations can be three. So one is the Japanese language education, and uh, Civil society sectors, NGOs, or university faculties are trying our best to offer some support. Uh, but uh, since any public support is uh, not given, uh, we are really struggling to give uh, enough opportunities for uh, all people who need that. 
and uh, some opportunities should be really provided uh, to learn the basics so that they can start working at least as, as part-time workers probably then uh, they can improve their Japanese so that they could be fully employed and can be a uh, member of this society and employment support uh, that should be also uh, added and uh, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, those people are really educated people and uh, educated by Japan and our society and the government has been investing a lot to educate them, nurture them, and uh, empower them to be a uh, competent person to build the uh, democratic Afghanistan. And uh, the former regime uh, was collapsed, but uh, now they are seeking place to live and work in the society. And uh, why don't we look at them as a human resources? Uh, of course, they need some uh, evacuation in this country, but uh, with a little help for all the language and employment support, actually they are the people who can really contribute to the society once they learn the language and also the business customs. And lastly, the family reunification. Uh, this is a bit of human right issues, and uh, we are working hard to uh, give any uh, legal status so that uh, the younger generations can get a visa. Uh, if they can get a student visa as a language school student, university student, of course, they have, they can come here, but the most difficult thing is the uh, generation of the parent. Uh, it's really hard to get a visa uh, for their vacation. And the fact that being in Japan can be a risk for their families, and uh, they are really in anxiety of the safety of those remaining families in Afghanistan. And the uh, last slide is about, uh, whoops, uh, this is a bit difficult. How I can do this? Whoops. Do you have? Do you need some help? Maybe yeah, we can I just. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, I got it. Yep, I got it. Yes. And no, here. If you can just talk yeah. over while yeah, okay. we take a look at it. And uh, probably uh, I want to lastly uh, touch upon the uh, difference for the policy of the Ukrainians, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we understand that uh, the phenomenon are different. Uh, Ukrainian situation is uh, uh, apparently the aggression of the international law. And uh, uh, as a person who's been involved in the uh, refugee issues for long, uh, we really uh, feel that uh, the, the quick action by the government can be uh, really, really highly evaluated. And uh, I feel like I've seen a kind of a good things, almost miracle happens every day. And uh, government policy, but also the contribution from a lot of sectors in the society are seen. And uh, we're really uh, happy to see that. And actually, I'm one of them to uh, make a room for Ukrainians to continue the education. Uh, however, uh, I feel we should shed a bit more attention, more light on Afghans uh, who are uh, in similar situation and uh, uh, some room should be made for them and uh, I wouldn't really appeal to the society and the government has its own policy and uh, uh, they've been uh, doing what they can and uh, this uh, conference is named about uh, discrimination but we're not we didn't name it, and actually, uh, we're, not, we're not blaming anybody that the food, somebody's deliberately discriminating uh, uh, Afghans or Syrians or anybody. But uh, as a result, uh, there's huge difference. And uh, what we believe is uh, uh, the civil society or the uh, private sector can can do more, and uh, there's now a lot of resources to support Ukrainians. So if we uh, include those Afghans in those efforts like housing or Japanese language education or family support, then uh, there's now huge resources offered for Ukrainian evacuees. So uh, probably we can look at more closely on the other people, uh, especially Afghans who are also in the similar needs and can give support. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat>
thank you very much, Orison. And we'd like to keep this uh, on the screen, if that's OK with you. Okay. Um, yep. Yes, um, let's begin the discussion um, by let me ask you, um, both of you, um, despite being a signatory to the refugee conventions, why has Japan traditionally been so reluctant to take in refugees, like to the point of, you know, um, just one percent of all applications um, pass. This is also one of the questions I received from um, online, uh, Walter Sim um, of uh, the Straits Times, and that was also on my mind. Could you please uh, elaborate shortly, and then we'll open it for questions on the floor. Okay, so uh, as far as I understand, uh, the government of Japan regards those two issues separately, and uh, uh, their standing point is uh, they observe the convention, and uh, from our observation, uh, they interpret the uh, convention uh, as what is written. And uh, I'm an implementer, uh, implementing organization, and uh, my our position is a. Uh, uh, each country can have a different policy, and uh, if adequate support can be given for uh, Ukrainians or Afghans or Syrians, or whatever they call called, uh, evacuees, uh, in a broader sense, they are refugees, and uh, uh, government takes some exceptional policy toward Afghans, of course, and uh, uh, I don't want, really want to yeah, it's a really a uh, tragedy that you know this uh, very issue uh, stuck in the middle of those uh, discussion and the practical actions are not taken. So uh, uh, probably uh, we need a lot of more discussion in the parliament and the, in the mm -hmm. media uh, about what's going to be the appropriate way to uh, organize the refugee policy of Japan. But uh, people are in need now and. Uh, Regardless of that discussion, uh, we should give support uh, in any possible means uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. And I suppose a discussion will take place, right? It was announced uh, on April 8th that a bill would be introduced in the diets in yeah. summer. Um, what we would call a quasi-refugee status will be created. They call it complementary protection, I believe. Ogawa-sensei or uh, Ori-sensei, would you li like to comment? Okay, so uh, there was a, another bill uh, which was submitted last year, and uh, I believe the discussion will start again. And uh, what should be included in the complementary protection? Uh, that same uh, phrase, is, same word is used in Europe, but uh, the concept is, seems to be different. So uh, we really hope some uh, positive <laughs> uh, discussion should be made and some agreement should be reached so that all people in need can get uh, sufficient support. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Ogawa-sensei, would you like to comment? Why has traditionally Japan been so reluctant <clears throat> to take in refugees? Mm, I think there are different studies, and I'm not really a scholar on refugee law, so my observations are very limited. But it seems to me that oh, for this refugee, we need to understand what persecution is. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be persecuted with this well-founded fear. So I think that kind of understanding remains to be very limited within this administrative procedure in the immigration agency. And there seems like a naive kind of um, understanding about how state institutions work. For example, the police or the, the justice system. So in a way, if you are born and grown up in Japan, of course you would like to have a faith in those state institutions. But in many of those countries where the refugees um, come from, actually the state governance mechanism has been close to collapse. Mm -hmm. So that kind of understanding of persecution seems to matter a lot when the, the people make decision about refugee recognition. And I believe you are a refugee counselor. Uh, <laughs> and could you quickly tell us um, an example or a case where you assessed and uh, it was a success, maybe? Um, well, I only got this position last September. So the cases that I dealt with 
are pretty limited. But within my limited experience, I thought that it's going to be very difficult. For one thing is that because uh, those who assess the, the refugee recognition are not really trained well, uh, including the understanding of what is a persecution, well-founded fear of persecution is about, mm -hmm. and what are the situation in those uh, origin countries, and how does the government and the politics and the religion and the society has been organized there. And that also goes to us as a refugee uh, counselor. Mm -hmm. We don't have good or enough training on how we should assess, mm. make an assessment of who is going to be a refugee. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like to open it for the comments or questions on the floor. Anyone? Please, Kaldun, and state your name and affiliation. Thank you, Kaldun Azari, Arabic Japan, Panorama News. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I, I think I, uh, first I have to sympathize with all refugees in the world. It's without question that they need all kind of support. But uh, as you said, I heard uh, many comments that uh, the Ukrainian refugees are getting kind of royal treatment, which is good for anybody. I'm not against it. That's great. Uh, compared to other refugees, so like uh, one uh, lady, Ukrainian, received one million yen gift from Fukuoka government, and uh, some refugees came on a government airplane from Poland mm -hmm. with the foreign minister, and also they were received in some embassies, so that's great. But other refugees are, as you explained to us, uh, are in a very dangerous situation. So uh, do you think the reason for that is that the uh, political reasons, because Ukrainian-Russian war is seriously impacting uh, the world, so Japan has to deal with the refugees in different way for political reasons, not because of refugees' policies. And that's exception that should be uh, accepted by the people. And secondly, do you recommend some refugees use a kind of contact lens that gives them better chance to change the color of their eyes uh, so they can get better chance to get such real treatment. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Haldun. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I have asked the government mm -hmm. <laughs> what is the reason of this different treatment because I have been struggling to get the visa for the for the Afghans in the past. And then suddenly you have this very different kind of treatment that has been provided. So when I asked, the reply was that uh, the Ukrainians, this is a kind of a special treatment for Ukrainians. So we cannot consider the other nationals on the same basis. But they did not particularly explain the reason why it cannot be treated samely. And I, I, I'm really struggling with this now. So what I can say is that since you're from the media, may probably you can inquire to the government why they are, uh, what, what, on what basis can this be justified and explained? Maybe you can conduct a research on that. And uh, secondly, I'm, I'm not very sure what the chances are. I feel that it is, in a way, a kind of a institutionalized, um, what they call racism, if I may say, that mm -hmm. brings out and justifies this different kind of treatment. So yes, I was about to say that, oh yes, there are Afghans who have blue eyes, but of course that's not the solution, right? So, I mean, they, they are really feeling desperate that they are forgotten, and that's why we are here today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, um, and I might, if I may add, um, this refugee policy by Japan some critics say it's a very utilitarian or functional type of policy. It's the economic first, you know, um, or seeing foreigners through an economic lens, maybe. Uh, what 
some called perceived usefulness to the society. Um, so the same question maybe, Orisan, perhaps if I may ask you uh, in relation to uh, this question, um, do you think in that respect, the more educated, westernized, highly skilled Eastern Europeans have a better chance than Afghans and Syrians uh, in, a, in a developed country like Japan? Is that what the government thinks perhaps or the public thinks? Thank you, but uh, I'd rather say that the those Afghans uh, who are you know concerned are also really highly educated people, probably more yes. educated than the average Ukrainian evacuees in Japan. So, uh, as I see it, I, th there's a political difference, and uh, the, what is happening in Ukraine, uh, aggression by Russia, and uh, what is happening in Afghanistan, a uh, collapse of its own government and the change of the government, and the government is persecuting those people. So the phenomena are different. And uh, as I understand, the government uh, is insisting that you know the cause of the uh, the evacuation are different, so the policies are different. That's what they say. And uh, uh, we can you know uh, discuss about discrimination, but the, uh, I, I don't think it and will lead, lead us to any productive uh, result. And uh, if you really look at the utility or uh, capability of those people, then uh, I really want to focus on that point. And uh, uh, we've been working for Syrian refugees, actually. And uh, uh, we've been helping them to admit to this country as a student. And uh, they're really hardworking people and uh, now being employed or being a university student. And government, we've been actually uh, working closely with this project with the government. And uh, mm. uh, why don't we look at those Africans in the same way? And uh, we, we, if you look at in that aspect, uh, of course, there's humanitarian aspect. But also, uh, there's a kind of a trend in international refugee policy that uh, uh, civil society and the government can focus more on this side, uh, how uh, mm -hmm. those refugees or evacuees can contribute to the society and uh, uh, we can help them as workers uh, because the status for the refugees are really limited in some countries and in Japan there's a lot of issues here. But uh, if you look at them as uh, workers or uh, highly skilled people, then there's other way of looking at them. Yeah. So that's I'd like to suggest. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, hi, Subendrini Kakuchi. I'd like to ask both uh, speakers, how are the um, Afghan and the Syrian refugees who have been accepted in Japan settling down? I think one of your surveys shows that around 40% are not happy with their jobs, so they still find them challenging. Any comments on their, their resettlement? You mean Africans? Um, Afghans and the Syrians also, Syrians. I think you're helping them. Okay. So about the Africans, uh, the survey was conducted in February, and uh, most of them were still uh, under short-term visa or professor visa, uh, but the, those professors' visas were issued by universities to give them some visa to arrive in Japan, and uh, this is not a permanent uh, employment opportunity. So uh, what is wanted for those evacuees are uh, they could arrive here in Japan and can work at a university for a certain period, three months, six months, and one year maximum, but while Doing that, they need to master the local language and have to find an another employment. So this is what is uh, seen in this survey. And so their situation is uh, a bit different from the uh, Syrians I mentioned. So those Syrians are uh, first, uh, they enter the language school, uh, and they be trained for two years to master the language. Then uh, they will proceed to the employment opportunities or higher education. So. Uh, they don't have 
so much difficulties in you know finding employment or uh, scholarships. So the starting point are very different. So that's why we recommended that some Japanese education is critically uh, necessary for those people, and that can really turn these people into a very uh, competent. Uh, human resources for this society, and actually, this society really needs a lot of skilled workers. Yes. <clears throat> yes. If I may add, uh, I think that has something to do with how the Japanese labor market has been organized. There is not so much job for those highly skilled if they can only speak English, right? So most of them are very good in. English, but for example, if you're a medical doctor, but if you don't have the national uh, certificate of a medical doctor in Japan, if you haven't passed it, you cannot really practice. So similarly, uh, there are a lot of institutional barriers that has been created within the job market. And so far, even though you're a PhD, the only job available may be just like in the factory or uh, in the bed or the hotel bed making. So there's a big discrepancy in how we we the the, the Japanese labor market has been organized in hindering them to to enhance their capabilities. So I think that's why it the the, the reason was written like that. Thank you. So I believe uh, we all agree if Japan considers these evacuees um, who state their intention to stay in this country for the rest of their lives, maybe not as evacuees but migrants and grant them long-term residence or any other residence, any other status, like in other countries, um, so that these people can work, pay their taxes and integrate into a society. Uh, so it's a win-win situation for Japan, which is obviously the population decreasing and graying. Um, that would be the ideal, I think. Um, any comments? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> please state your name and affiliation. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comment. I'm Kojima Mei from NHK World. Um, I would like to ask about the former students who are still in Afghanistan. Um, they are, as you told me, that they're still struggling to the, the situation in Afghanistan. So I would like to ask you, the, Professor Ogawa-sensei, um, how about support for universities in Japan? So what is most needed for right now from the government support? I would like to ask this comment. Also, I would like to ask you about the message to the Japanese government about the, how we can support the former students who are still in Afghanistan. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Well, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's especially difficult for the universities who had received a large number of uh, students from Afghanistan. Like in one university, they had like more than 90 uh, Afghan students in the past 20 years. And when they asked the the former students, they wanted to evacuate like 179 people, including their families. So this is simply not possible for one university to sustain <laughs> economically uh, together with the livelihood of their families. So really only a very limited number of those who are uh, evacuated, the, the fortunates are evac being able to evacuate. And for that, I think the, the, what we have been requesting is a public funding to support the, the former students as well as the university. The university has been trying to provide like free housing using their dormitories, but that's all that they can do. And the, the, the professors are struggling to find an employment through their research budget. But say, for example, if your uh, supervisor has retired already, there's nothing that they can do. So the universities are really caught in between those voices of the evacuees and um, no re response from the government side. So public funding is one thing. And um, 
the, the flexible issuing of the visa, which the Japanese government will not do anyway. But as I have explained, the, the major concern for those evacuees are about the families left behind. So for the well-being of those students, to be able to either concentrate on their study in Japanese or in their expertise and contribute to the society, they really have to have a peace of mind. And that means family reunification. So uh, these kind of things are pretty much needed. Thank you. Thank you. So if I may ask, what is the situation now in Afghanistan? We hear stories, of course, every day. And there was a bombing in a, near a boys' school, a Shiite, I believe, um, minority school. And the girls are ban um, you know, banned from attending secondary school. Do you get uh, updated information? If you could, both of you, maybe share from your um, respondents. Right. Well, I hear that it's more and more depressing. The prices are getting higher. The salary hasn't been paid or decreased. And the security situation is really worsening. And the people are trying to leave the country. But the issuing of the passport is another issue. Mm. The, the Taliban does not have a good governance capability. So the number of the passport that can be issued are very limited and they close their office very often. Mm. So unless you get all these documents being prepared, you cannot leave the country. So those desperate people are crossing the borders illegally. Mm -hmm. And of course, that is becoming a major problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, uh, so could I ask Please, something? yes. So, um, actually, the evacuation is continuing, and uh, mm -hmm. there's a request to support uh, for Afar every week. And uh, universities are still making efforts to invite and host former students' families. And they are arriving uh, every month, and uh, they need to raise fund, prepare uh, everything to receive families, and they cannot invite 30, 40 people at a time. So several families are right, then they help them, then they are next, then they're gonna raise the fund and invite the families. And while doing that, you know, some people are desperately waiting for the opportunities. And uh, what is needed is that for some people, uh, getting short-term visa is impossible uh, because their insurance is limited only for those former students themselves. So uh, for those people, uh, we need to, get a kind of a, a, any visa for student or employment. And if they are become a student of a language school or employee of a Japanese, lang Japanese company, then they can get a visa to come here. So we need, we are really working hard to find those opportunities. And for those people who can get a visa, uh, but still there's a financial issues, uh, who covers the travel fee? And after they arrive here, who can cover the housing? And who can cover the Japanese language study cost? So these need to be, uh, these funds to be raised. And actually, uh, we are calling some university people to gather together to start a crowdfunding uh, to cover the travel fee and also the uh, living cost. Uh, otherwise, uh, it's really uh, over the burden of the uh, each and particular universities or faculty members or NGOs to cover all the costs. Yes. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, there's a question online from Eri Irie of Nippon Terebi, and maybe directly asking about this. As a Japanese, is there anything we can do and how to face these problems? So is there um, some name of an organization, something that you can share um, that ordinary Japanese people can contribute to, donate to, if they feel so strongly about this issue? Hmm. OK, so. Uh I'm uh, originally from uh, Pathway Japan, and uh, we are having mm. a program for admitting people with refugee background as students, uh, mm. for language students. And uh, we include Syrians, Afghans, and now Ukrainians. So uh, if we can receive the donation, then we can host some Afghans to be a student of language school. That, and that's actually, we already launched that program, but we need more funding to support, have more mm. Afghans to join this program. So that this is. One example, yes. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Any 
names from you, Ogawa-sensei? Um, yeah, well, in the long run, I think there are a lot of things that we can do, uh, mm. which we are already seeing in the case of Ukraine, that the local governments, mm. the NPOs, the communities, the schools, they are trying to link up and provide support, mm -hmm. which is a kind of a model, a very good model that we are seeing today. So we would like to include the other mm -hmm. refugee uh, status uh, people mm -hmm. from Myanmar, from Syria, the Rohingyas, and the Afghans. So that is where we would like to head towards. But in the short term, I think Ori-san's uh, proposal to support, to, to provide scholarship is really very, very important and needed. Because if you want them to be enrolled in the Japanese language school, you need to have like 1 million to 2 million yen mm -hmm. per person in your bank account. And that is really very difficult, aside from the travel cost and the housing and living expenses. So that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. And there's a question uh, from Isabel Reynolds of Bloomberg, do you see any chance that Ukraine could open Japan's eyes to the plight of refugees from other countries and regions? And she's asking again about the uh, complementary protection or this quasi-refugee category. What do you make of this proposal to create this new category? Uh, okay, so um, actually I myself are also involved in the program to support Ukrainians and uh, I'm contacting with Ukrainian communities here in Japan and also a lot of corporate companies, municipalities and uh, I see hope here and uh, I'm really amazed to see a lot of support offered for this phenomenon and it is something about war, it's clearly war and I really feel relieved that you know, Japan Japanese people can be really sympathetic for those people who are suffering from the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it seems like a, so much resources are now given for, sub, to support Ukrainians. So we need to set up a more effective way of uh, matching those needs and support. But once those systems are established, then uh, I really see hope that the other people can be included here and uh, can have a more comprehensive uh, support. So this is not just about the government, but, but the society is now mm. taking action so we can uh, integrate those efforts for other nationalities. So the Japanese public is becoming more responsive mm -hmm. in that sense. I believe they, there was a protest actually uh, at some point to support the Ukrainians, and um, which was not something we usually see here. Um, any final question? Yes, uh, please. Uh, do you have data on how many refugees or evacuees uh, from Ukraine and from Afghanistan and third size, maybe Syria? Do you have latest data? And secondly, the, the, the war in, in Ukraine it seems to be expanding and uh, it might turn into third world war, actually. So that means more refugees or more evacuees might come. Do you think Japan is going to take more, as many as possible, and keep providing this generous support? Thank you. OK, so uh, I put some figures on the slide shown on the screen at the bottom. So this is one of the latest figures, uh, 649 Ukrainians. And uh, uh, the date are not exactly the same, but uh, 570 as of March for Africans. And for the number of Syrians, it's not listed here. And uh, who can be counted as a refugee? That's uh, There's no statistics, but you can refer to the statistics by the immigration, how many Syrians are in Japan. I think it's around 600 to 700, yes. And for the second question, uh, so sorry, what was the question? <laughs> Will the uh, g government continue this yeah, generous yeah. support if the uh, war enlarges? Hmm? I think, I think uh, it's over 600 and every week, every week 100 are arriving, so it's going to reach soon 1,000 inevitably. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems uh, 
the admission may continue for a while. And uh, of course, there should be some argument uh, how many Japan can admit, but uh, so far, uh, there should be a lot of discussions uh, in the parliament or in the government, but uh, uh, as far as I know, uh, th there's no restriction for arriving them. And uh, uh, I think the society are ready to admit more people. And uh, yeah, nobody can expect, and this is the very first phenomenon that we are seeing. So uh, it's going to be how many, it's really unpredictable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It kind of reminds, uh, back in history, I think, after, after the Vietnam War, Japan had accepted huge number of uh, refugees uh, from different countries, uh, about 11,000 11, or something, 000. which was very unheard of, I, uh, I believe, in recent times. Um, thank you, everyone, for your attention. And thank you, um, Dr. Reiko Ogawa of Chiba University and Norimasa Ori of Pathways Japan. I declare the press event. Final concluded. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.